Success Insight shares the stories of the people with passion and drive who make things happen in the world. Here's your host, Howard Fox. Hello, everybody. This is Howard Fox, your host of the Success Insight podcast. Our guest today is Dr. Thomas Caulfield. Tom is the author of Ephatha, Growing Up Profoundly Deaf and Not Dumb in the Hearing World, a Basketball Player's Transformational Journey to the Ivy League. The true story of Ephatha is a compilation of personal journal entries by Dr. Caulfield in which he painstakingly wrote over a 20-year period. It documents the legendary journey of his son, Christopher, and his family's valiant attempts at helping Christopher be the best he could be. Without further ado, Thomas Caulfield, Dr. Thomas Caulfield, welcome to the Success Insight Podcast. Thank you, Howard, and I really appreciate your kind introduction there. It was very nice of you to speak that way about our book. Well, I am excited because I love inspirational journeys and and also journeys of transformation and we transform in ways it's not in ways that we can know going in what how things are going to turn out but to me this book was around inspiration which anybody with a disability can overcome it if he has the support of family friends guides along the way and the transformation of just kind of hearing about your son and his successes. So a lot to talk about. And I guess the best thing we can do is let's start from the beginning. Tell us a little bit about yourself, who you are, and then let's get into talking about Christopher and because he's, this book is about him and his journey too. Sure. I'm an academically oriented person. A lot of research in my field. I'm retired now. I, I say 30 odd years in college and university administration. I stress the odd year because if I tell them exactly how many years I toiled away in that business, people will put the numbers together and say, man, he is old. But anyway. I think you look younger than I do, by the way. Oh, that's nice of you to say. <laughs> in your earlier remarks, this concept of, of ephetha, that's an old word, the title of our book. It's an Aramaic word. It's 3,000 years old. And you talked about how someone could be successful. What would it take? And you hit on some really great points there. The other thing I'd like to mention is that word actually means to open up or to be opened. And our sense is with what happened to us, and I'm an educator myself, we had a lot to learn. We had to open up. Our son, Christopher, had to open up to a whole series of new circumstances in his life. And we'd like to say that a whole round of individuals that he met along his journey, his transformational journey, needed to open up as well. The sad reality is, Howard, that's all said in the book. It's it's something I toiled away at for 20 years. That's two decades, and it was a secret. Yet a lot of people did open up, luckily for us. Some did not. We do go over that territory very specifically. And for the audience to calm themselves, and Howard, I think you you know this because you know enough about the book, There's no physical abuse. There's no harm to Christopher, but there's some emotional things that happened to him along the way that are pretty difficult. The reality is, is he wasn't setting any records being invited to birthday parties growing up. So you find yourself doing other things. And how wild is this? He starts to play a lot of basketball. And that's a lot of time in the driveway shooting by yourself and being alone. And Boy, he turned out to be quite a basketball player, Yes, to say the least. Yes, he did. Yeah, which is pretty exciting, yeah, from our point of view. So when Christopher was born, was the the disability, was was it realized at the onset, or was there some event, an illness that just kind of triggered it? Yeah, well, that's a great question. Back then, we're talking about 1995, 96 now. There's a test called newborn screening, which can be used to determine if your child is, in fact, deaf. That In those years, it wasn't actually done yet, okay? So many parents went home, and they didn't know that their son or daughter was deaf. And the average time that they discovered is about 12 months, believe it or not. You'd think it would be earlier, but you know, a lot of babbling and just playing around in that first year, and you're not really tuned into those things. So we discovered, just like everybody else, right on average, about 12 months. 
And how it happens is a little bit like the movie Mr. Holland's Opus. There's a drop in something in and around the home, and the child doesn't turn. So that's the event, and, and that's when you have to take your child in for testing and learn just essentially what you think is going on. And in the case of deafness, there's all different levels. Sadly, in Christopher's case, there was no hearing at all. You'll deal with diagnoses that really make determinations on, okay, it's a mild hearing loss. Maybe it's a moderate one. Hearing aids will work. We had no hearing at all, so we actually tried hearing aids for a while. And this is all detailed in the book, the hardship of those and those just not working for us. And so that kind of is the springboard as to you putting things forth in your mind because you have to move in a different direction. I think the audience should know that 90% of the kids that are born in the world that are deaf are born to hearing parents. And so, you know, sometimes people think, well, gosh, you know, they have probably have deaf parents, deaf grandparents, they know what deafness is. We don't have it in our family anywhere. We didn't know what to do. And so the book kind of chronicles, what do, what do you do? And, and how, do you, how do you make ends meet? And a lot of good research and, and a lot of help and a lot of people opening up. I'm curious, back in 95, 96, so much has happened within the healthcare and the technology of healthcare and what is available. My own niece, her her daughter, my, my great niece, has a disability. And occasionally I hear get stories on Facebook and I'll see them next week for Thanksgiving. But you hear stories on Facebook of, of the other parents, other kids, and, and some of the comments or the, 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 the ignoring or the not including of the, the, the child with the disability in functions, either because Maybe they're afraid. Maybe they don't know about it. Is this something that's contagious? I don't know. And it, but there's just there is misinformation about disability. And I'm wondering, as you were growing into this experience, as you and your wife were growing into this experience with Christopher, what was your sense of the? the community beyond the immediate family, because the immediate family and your closest friends, they're all in. Okay. They're there with you. Outside of that close knit group, you go out of level, you start to get people that are just not aware of it. It's not because there's malice. It's just, they don't know. And they're maybe just a little bit afraid. And what was your sense as you kind of were taking notes and journaling of the effect in your perception of the community around you and their, in, say, interpretation of, uh, of this disability? The first recognition point, I talk about it early on in the book, is when you're standing in the checkout lines. And by the way, we're not these people that... And, and I want to say that the way you framed that question was really great, this concept of malice. Who, who thinks poorly about people because they have a disability? No, it's really not it. But when we were trying the hearing aids, Howard, we started to pick up on a lot of extended gazes in the grocery lines and stuff. To add a little levity, because it is kind of sad, Christopher would just smile back at them when they would gaze with that extended gaze. And I say in the book, I'm not trying to be negative, but I say I, I wondered when those extended gazes in life would begin to bother him. But he would just smile back. But you know what it was, it, to address your point, it was people kind of feeling sorry for him because they hadn't really seen toddlers with hearing aids on, you know, used to seeing that with adults, you know, they know what the deal is. The person can't hear, the kid can't hear, the, the infant can't hear. And they just probably wonder in their own peace of mind what that person's life is going to be like. So the book, it kind of really has nice trajectory off of that because we went forward after that with no resolution to get a cochlear implant in it was under an experimental trial. They were doing those in those days after 24, at 24 months. We were in an experimental trial at 18 months, luckily. And it worked great. I mean, we, we were down. The hearing aids were ineffective and we needed something. And boy, did we get it. We got a Rolls-Royce device, a medical device that 
really changed our lives. And how great is this? Right at that time, this St. Joseph's School for the Deaf started a satellite school in our hometown in Champaign, Illinois. And they, they had their main school in St. Louis, and it's a bunch of French nuns that started it. In the 1800s, they came over just to help deaf kids with hearing loss. And so it's almost like a miracle. You have deafness told to you one month and a school starts and you get a cochlear implant five months later and you're the first student at the school. It's almost divine intervention in our mind. (laughs) Just couldn't have worked out better for us. We were so lucky. When I was reading some of the the background material on the website and, and about the book, there is a lot of mention around the the number of hours of therapy, yeah. hearing therapy that Christopher had to go through. I mean, it was a 1,500, 1,500 hours, Howard. Good, good research. Yeah, 1,500 hours by the time he was nine years old. We kept track of all those hours, both in the clinic and at home. I'd like to tell listeners that that's rigorous work. We don't have too much of a fond nickname for the speech therapy people. We don't call them speech speech therapists. We call them speech terrorists. They are relentless. They will not give up and they will not let you give up either. They get it going and we model that at home. But to put it in perspective of how rigorous the work is, the audience will probably go, I can't believe that. But it's a fact. It took us 30 days to teach Christopher the ah sound. Really? Yeah. And so my wife and I, when we would go at that glacial pace in all the vowels and the consonants, we said to ourselves, gosh, I wonder if there's enough time actually in the early childhood to get all this in. Because Howard, you know, you, you and I were born just like everybody else that's hearing. And your mom probably said one day, yeah, I sound to you. Ah, I probably put it on a ma, you know, and you, you said it back. It was probably instantaneous. It could have been 10 seconds, maybe a little babbling around. I know I was talking by, by nine months. <laughs> and I don't mean that arrogantly. <laughs> Just many of us talk fast. You know, I'm a talker. And so then there's 30 days. And it's not like we were working on it five seconds a day. So it really puts it in perspective big time of the, the nature of the journey that we were about to get on. Mm. And it's not for the faint of heart. And people that read it, they're like, I can't believe this. <laughs> Who would do this for this long? And how can you hang in there at all these times? I am curious, just thinking about the the duration and the the rigor of the the treatment, and it's the like you were as parents, Christopher, his healthcare providers were all in. Oh yeah, this is not inexpensive healthcare. Oh no. And being a, a university educator, and we don't know a lot about what work your, your wife was doing. I don't think we ever had that conversation. And she's hospital administration, so yeah, we're same kind, kind of work. Okay. Sure. So, mm-hmm. how is it like? And the reason I'm asking this because a number of my guests who have been on the podcast have either written about the healthcare system, either in the form of fiction, conspiracy. Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. have been the recipients of the healthcare system, whether it be the commercial or government, the VA, and stories somewhere in, perhaps in the middle. And and I'm curious what the experience for you and your wife was with the healthcare system to get Christopher the treatment he needed to get him enrolled in an experiment, which today is like, oh, cochlear implant, great, mm-hmm. that's what we'll do. Knock it out, but yeah. back. Yeah, way back when, Whoa. that was leading edge. Oh, tell me about it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What was the experience overall with the, about the healthcare system? My wife, Jennifer, is in the healthcare system. And so when you're in, you know the terrain really well. And you know how it works and who to work with. So we would rate it as an A plus because we were in and, and, and we knew the network. I, I don't know that I could rate it that high if we were outside of the network, and we were always yearning. It propelled us to form a support group very quickly for others that were coming after Christopher so they too could understand the network. I think your question has another level since we're talking about all the supporters. I I wish I could sit here and tell you today that on an 
educational level. Now that's my area, right? That they would be all in. I, I found that finances played a real critical role in the therapy and there was some responsibility, shared responsibilities with the school districts and things went well to a certain age and then it didn't go so well. And we're a strong Christian family. And the last thing we want to do is to take legal action against folks because of their responsibilities via the American Disability Act. But, you know, they get into some, some, some funny talk with you. And to this day, I, I really don't appreciate the talk. The talk is, hey, we're going to do this, this, and this, and this has proven effective for us. And I countered with, here I am. This is what I do. I research these things hard. This is the therapy that we want. We're going to front load this so that Christopher, and we had our goal set, Christopher's going to be talking at this age, he's going to be reading at this age, and it really wasn't in their plan. They might get that later, but I said, uh, I've hired a CPA, he's run the numbers, we're going to save you actually $440,000 in services because there'll be a point where Christopher won't need these services, the sign language, things like that, that'll all go away. He won't be using that in high school that much at all. And, well, that's great, but that's really too far out there for us. This is the way we do it. So we had to seek legal action. We prevailed, and there was no looking back. But so we don't alienate any communities. It's an and both proposition. The best intervention strategies, Howard and your audience should hear this, are help helping these young people learn sign language, but also if they have a cochlear implant for sure learn oral methodology, meaning learning how to talk. There's no sense having that device on your cranium and an electrode array going down to your auditory nerve in your brain if you're not going to learn how to talk with it. Yeah, sure. probably a solid C on the educational level, A plus on the hospital level clinic. And you also mentioned about the the support because you and your wife have navigated this path. And in some ways, you were the first ones on the path. Yeah, we were the first student at that satellite school. Yeah. Sure. Agreed. And, and this is something I'm learning from my, my niece. And I think I want to share this podcast with her because I really I wanted her to come onto the podcast to talk about my great niece and some of the challenges and how she's overcoming some of the pitfalls, the block roadblocks, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But the point that you're making, and I think is incredibly important, is the creation of a support group for others who are going to be facing something like and similar to have a place that they can go to, to talk to you, to talk to your wife, Jennifer, to talk to Christopher about this is what I'm going through. These are the questions I have. Here's how I navigate going to the birthday party for the first time or I'm going out to dinner or I'm in line at, a, at the fast food restaurant. This mm-hmm. is for the parents. You know, how do you tell a young couple who perhaps from a psychological standpoint are blaming themselves for the disability for their, for their child? Right. And those types of support groups are so incredibly important. And you touched on that. And I'm curious how has that evolved? Oh, it's great. It's still in existence today. The other thing that I wanted to mention is it can get pretty basic. And you know what? There's a salient variable here that is really hard to watch. And that is families that have children with disabilities. And let's just talk about our experience with deafness. And poverty is a very, very, very powerful element in their lives. I still remember us coaching one particular mother and her her mother was there as well, the single parent situation about how you can ask for tennis balls to be sliced and put underneath the chairs in the classroom. So when they don't have carpet, that this ambient noise doesn't drive your son crazy with his hearing aids with all those chairs scooting around. This is where it gets to be troubling because they were starting to believe that they call them the individual educational program assessment some people, not mean-spirited, but it gets down to money and stuff. I didn't think tennis balls were that expensive. See, see how flip I get about these things. But but these uh, people were telling them through the schools that that wasn't possible or this wasn't possible. We kind of kept coaching them to say, you have every right to ask for that. 
please continue to ask for that. And here's some other things that you want to ask for. And suddenly there's improvement. The child can focus better and stuff like that. Christopher and I went out to many home visits to families to talk to them and they're beside themselves. We know that pain and, and we wanted to go back when they had received that diagnosis and get with them and, and tell them that there is hope. And, and Christopher was, as he got older, he, he, he really was quite a role model for that because there's nothing like being told your son or our daughter is deaf and then you have this kid come to your house that might be 15 and he's talking like you and I are talking here today. It is pretty startling when you have no hearing at all and they're just thinking like we were, what do we do now? And well, here, here's, what you, here's what you can do. There's a possibility here. If that's not a harbinger of hope, I don't know what is. And, yeah. you know, it's interesting. I, I was uh, looking on the website at, at, at some of the YouTubes and the, you and your wife and Christopher going to the facility where the disabled kids were. And the Swan Center. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it's amazing. And talk about giving back and, and seeing some of the videos and reading about and And I also had read about the article about Michael and Christopher, the other basketball player. Oh, ESPN covered yeah. the story. Yes, sure. Pretty mm -hmm. amazing. And it just, yeah. To, to address your point there, there's some intentionality there. You talk about the Swan Center. Those are kids that, and you, you gleaned this from what you saw there on the video, and we hope other uh, listeners can get to our website and look, look at things like that. But when you think about deafness, the plan Jennifer and I had was, you know, let's get around folks with disabilities and let's better understand those. Oh, gosh, Howard, as you learned, those kids that are in the Swan Center, they never leave the Swan Center. That's a residential program, and they, they, never, they never leave there. They die there. These are multiple disabilities. And so Christopher would come away from those volunteer experiences and say, boy, I'll take deaf. You know, look what these kids are struggling with. And so you sit there and go, gosh, that's a good thing for all of us to learn is we could get a little whiny, start feeling sorry for ourselves. And when you see these folks that are institutionalized, their parents' situation is bad, you know, shaking babies and little limbs and IQs that are like 40, you just say, we'll do what we can. We sang songs and, you know, just we're there with them. Yeah. Powerful stuff, though. Powerful stuff. I say to Christopher to this day, as we think about the hardships that happened in our life, I say, Christopher, hey, weird question from the old man here. Is there any... Is there, is there any way you would have accomplished some of the things you've done in your life if, if it wasn't as hard as it was growing up? He's like, Dad, You're like you know how kids are. What a, what a dumb question. Of course I wouldn't have been able to do all this. Man, I, I worked so darn hard <laughs> to get where I was at. You know, that's all I know. And uh, it's kind of funny. It, one brief story I think the audience will really appreciate with that. We sent Christopher to a mainstream kindergarten after all of this work. Now, he's talking now, reading pretty much close to on time, and we're still working that out. My wife and I are beside ourselves. He comes home after the first day. And Howard, it's just what you were alluding to in a lot of your questions. Would he be accepted? Would they avoid him? Would he kind of be over on one side of the room and all the group is over on the other? He gets home. We're not going to be you know, get all intrusive here and say, hey, how'd it go? You know, let him spill, right? So just kind of like, you know, just silence. <laughs> and uh, he then kind of looks at us and we kind of said a little bit, we said, you go okay? He goes, you guys, I remember to this day, I quoted in the book. He goes, you guys, don't worry. It was easy. And I was like, easy? This is kindergarten, first, first experience at, at a school. And he says, it was easy. All they do is play. And I was like, Wow. I think I ruined my kid's life. All that speech therapy, all that rigor. The dude doesn't know how to play. The truth is, <laughs> he definitely learned how to play basketball for sure. Of and course. A Division one recruit at 13 years old. He, he knew how to play that game. Let's talk a little bit about that. So really, in, in all honesty, Tom, we could go on and on. This could be a long podcast. You could go for days. Yeah, right? or a couple podcasts. Yeah. But let's jump forward just a little bit. I mean, it, it, Christopher was being recruited. What happened at the point coming out of high school? He was probably pretty successful in high school playing basketball. Got recruited. What happened then? Christopher, he always had a lot of horsepower academically, Howard, e even to the point where it was kind of scary. My wife and I would look at each other. Is this kind of stuff run in your family? Not <laughs> necessarily this kind of stuff runs in my family. He finished high school in three years. Oh, wow. 
with the highest classes you can imagine. He started taking college courses at the community college at 15 years old with the with Jennifer had to go with him. That was the rule at the community college. So he's amassing a lot of credit for college. He ended up receiving an academic scholarship to go to college. Okay. Followed that up with a very strong fellowship to Cornell for graduate school. And I don't mean this as a braggy parent, but he and I had to have a talk one day about the odds of success. And I explained to him, and uh, he understood it right away, that the odds of him making it to the MBA were about one in 3,000. And the odds of him being a, a successful a software engineer and whatnot with his, his aptitude were probably about... It brings up another story. We were with a president from a university once, and he said he's recited this. He said, I think it's about a three or four chance of me going into software engineering and be successful professionally. And it's about a one in 3,000 chance in the NBA. And the president said, Christopher, I like what you said there, but at this university for you, it's a four out of four chance you will be successful as a software engineer. (laughs) And I kind of was like, oh, I'm glad somebody else has given this voice of reason to my son. But to be clear, Christopher wasn't really always like hardline wired to be a basketball player. He got an awful lot of recognition. There's no question. And he was always great all along the way. But when we would play AAU ball and the prodigies would come in the gym, those are people that would go one and done. And we're rolling with these people. Christopher turned into be a very average player. And he wouldn't be offended by me saying that about him because, Howard, you're a sports-oriented person. I know this. We're, we're trimming actually that top one hundredth of a percent in athletic ability here. And he's somewhere in that 99th percentile. Trust me, I, right. I, you don't get recruited when you're 13 if you're, you're, you're shooting in the wrong basket. <laughs> there's all, as Larry Bird once said, there's always somebody better. And when we played at the elite AAU level, there was always. Now, on the other hand, on the academic side, we were hard pressed to find some people that would graduate from high school in three years, get an academic scholarship for undergrad, and follow that up with a full ride and a fellowship to Cornell. What is Christopher doing now? Well, you know, as I say these things, I almost really, uh, we're such a humble family, but I, 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 I worry that even listeners, when they hear this, they'll say, oh, they don't even know what the real world is like. And I would, say, I would counter and say, Believe me, we do. We do. We do. I grew up a poor Irish Catholic in Chicago, so I, I, I know. I know what poor is. Christopher is with Microsoft okay. in artificial intelligence. Oh boy! And yeah, as he said to me one time, and this is so humbling. He says, "Hey, Dad," and don't look at this as money is important as it's not. He says, "Hey, Dad, is forty thousand a lot for a signing bonus?" And I said, "Son, that that works. Yeah, that works." He was on his way. And so he, he's so humble about things. He gets accepted uh, and hired by Microsoft. He writes them a note, a thank you note. He says, Thanks, thank you for demonstrating that your place is inclusive with, to, to everybody. And they write him back and they say, Christopher, get over it. You know what? This is how we roll. We have all different types of people working for us. And we know your skills. We know what you've been working on in undergrad, graduate school. We followed your research groups and who you've been involved with. You are totally a perfect fit for us. And it's great. It's, it's great. And he's having the time of his life up there, for sure. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. Tom, in, in the, the few minutes we have left, I wanted to acknowledge a couple of items here. One is your book has won a number of awards. And the one I saw was the designation was one of nine best New Basketball Players Books to Read in 2020, as featured on CNN, Forbes, and Inc. by Book Authority, which identifies and rates the best books in the world based on public mention, recommendations, ratings, and sentiment. That is, that's pretty darn good there. So congratulations on that. Well, thank you. Yeah, the only correction I would say there is, dang it, Howard got a little ahead of ourselves, but we'd, we'd, we'd like it to be like that in 2020, but it's 2019 for sure. Yeah, you had mentioned 2020, but I know what you meant. I'm yeah. telling you, I'm looking, then I've got to go back to the website or something said 2020, but I'm, hey, maybe, that, they, that, maybe they ranked us for next year. That'd be cool. But yeah, we were, we were so honored with that. Just kept coming and we just feel blessed about these whole things. It wasn't something we had like solicited or anything like that. But I got to tell you when it happened, 
We were just pinching ourselves, our whole family. But then, then when it happened again, it was more of a historical one. They ranked us, the numbers aren't important, but they ranked the top 30 basketball books of all time. And they put us in that category. You know, not to be all goofy, geeky, intellectual, but the truth is basketball in our book is just a metaphor for life. Right. In the interest of publicity and getting the word out there about the book, we'll take it. And Howard, you know this, but the audience doesn't, is all the profits from Epitha go to organizations that help kids with challenges in their life. It's not that we're trying to be rich and hoity-toity or anything like that. Look at us, draw attention to ourselves. We don't need the money. Those organizations do. As I've written a number of checks just this week based on royalties from last month, I'm so happy to do that. And I'm so happy to send it to all those groups that are in need that are really largely struggling. We hope that that makes a difference in what they do because these are the real skilled people that are dedicating their lives and their professions to help these children. Sure, Mm -hmm. most definitely. And we're going to do our part with the podcast and we want to make sure so that we can do our part that you let our listeners know if they want to learn more about you, Christopher, Jennifer, the book, the work that you're doing, where's the best place for them to go? Yeah, thank you. The the best place is to go to our website. We channel everyone through there and it's a busy place, but we are really excited about what's happening there. The media goes through there and everybody that writes through our website address we, our team answers them. It's epithabook.com. And let me spell that first part, E-P-H-P-H-A-T-H-A book.com. And give us feedback. We received a lot of positive feelings about that website. Like you alluded to, Howard, there's videos in there that go back in time that really show what it was like for Christopher in those early ages and what it's like now. And anytime you juxtaposition those two things, it has to entice someone to think, gosh, what happened in between that babbling youngster that could barely get words out to this kid giving the, it is what it is. He gave the commencement address at Cornell. That's phenomenal. Phenomenal. And we'll definitely, we'll post the backlinks on our show notes to the website. And between now and when we publish, if there's anywhere else that we need to provide backlinks to, even the Amazon page will provide a backlink to the book page on Amazon. If just any final thought before we head out this evening. Well, I think it's good that your audience realized people, and as they hear this, they are going through their own unique circumstances. And this isn't all about us. But what we want people to remember is that in, in life, and we learn this ourselves, that everybody has the right to be understood. That's a real important message that I wanted to leave you folks with. Fantastic. Well, Tom, I truly appreciate you taking time out of your day. And please thank Jennifer, your wife. Christopher, I, I do hope I get to, to meet you someday. I'm, I know it will happen. Our paths will cross. Knowing you, Howard, I bet you this will happen. I can feel it. Our paths will cross. Yes. So thank you again. It's been an absolute pleasure to get to know more about you, Jennifer, Christopher, the book, and just kind of the overall story. I mean, that's where the insight and the transformation is coming from. It's, it's the whole story. So we truly appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Howard. Enjoy the day. All right, folks, there you have it. We have been chatting with Dr. Thomas Caulfield. Tom is the author of Ephetha, Growing Up Profoundly Deaf and Not Dumb in the Hearing World, a basketball player's transformational journey to the Ivy League. And we've been chatting about his and his wife Jennifer's journey with their son, Christopher, who is that individual who had the, the, the deaf as a disability and their journey to really kind of they could sit back and look at look at where Christopher has gone is right now today and all that he is accomplishing so it's been a fantastic transformational conversation today and we truly appreciate it and as I say every podcast wherever you are whatever you're doing go out there have a phenomenal day and I'm going to add this little tagline go out there and make a difference people need your help take care now success insight is a production of fox coaching and first story strategies find us online successinsightpodcast.com